I'm going to tell you a story about how an illiterate outsmarted Nasser and Hadiza. This was a newlywed couple, I think about two, three years into the marriage. They were like what, what you'd call churawa. They had just bought this Mercedes-Benz 200 car. I think it was a Kumbo. And they had this habit of hanging the key. Because they had, they, were, they had no children. They had one Megad who was a Tuareg, Buzu. So they had this habit of hanging the key in an open place. Anyone that was going to drive would just take the car and drive. And this Tuareg must have thought, so these educated, smart people, because you know they're taking me for granted. Unknown to Nasser and Hadiza, this man went and learned how to drive. One day he just picked the key, entered the car in broad daylight, drove, and no one has seen him since that day. <laughs> This was 1988, you know? So um, I think the lesson there is that you can be the smartest person in the world and you can still be outsmarted by people uh, who you underestimate. Now, we talk about birthdays and talk about happiness. I remember a few weeks ago, someone asked me, are you happy? And I said, I hope not. And he was surprised. The truth is, nobody who is a leader in northern Nigeria today can afford to be happy. You can't be happy with 87% of the poverty in Nigeria being in the north. You can't be happy with millions of northern children out of school. You can't be happy with nine states in the north contributing almost 50% of the entire malnutrition burden in the country. You can't be happy with the drug problem you can't be happy with the Boko Haram problem. You can't be happy with political thuggery. You can't be happy with all the issues, the al problem that we have. So when we wish Nasser a happy birthday, we do not want him to be happy as a leader. Because you are happy when you think you have reached a state of delivering and taking your people to where you want them to be. Now because of the condition of northern Nigeria, it is almost cliche now to say if you are seen as normal, if you're a governor in the north or a leader in the north and if you are seen as normal in the sense that you continue to do what your predecessors have been doing, doing the same thing which has been normalized, then there's something wrong with you. You are part of the problem. The real change in the north will come from the mavericks, those who are considered mad people, because you look around and you have to say, if this is the way we have been doing things, and this is where we have ended up, maybe we need to do things differently. If we have populated the government with middle-aged men, maybe we need to try younger people. Maybe we need to try women. If we have spent our time and our money 
on physical infrastructure, maybe we need to invest more in the education of our children. Maybe we need to invest more in nutrition. Maybe we need to invest more in primary health care. And the truth is, if you look at what Nasser is doing in Kaduna with 40% of his budget in education, that is the only thing that is going to save the North. And I know that when we say these things, they don't go down well. We've been saying this for 20, 30 years. If the North does not change, the North will destroy itself. The country is moving on. Quota system that everybody talks about must have a sunset clause. The reason people like Nasser stand up and they're nationalists is that you don't have any sense of inadequacy. You don't need to right on being from Kaduna State or being from the North or being a Muslim to get a job. You go with your credentials, you go with your competence, you can compete with any Nigerian from anywhere. We need to get our Northern youth to a point where they don't need to rely on being from a part of the country to get a job. And believe me, if we don't listen, there will be a day when there will be a constitutional amendment that addresses this issue of quota system and federal character. The rest of the country cannot be investing, educating its children, producing graduates, and then they watch us, they can't get jobs because they come from the wrong state, when we have not invested in the education of our own children. So as we celebrate Nasser at 60, we need to celebrate him as a public officer who is addressing the core problems of his constituency. It is education. It's girl-child education. It's women's rights. It's child begging, parental irresponsibility, demographic growth, it's managing a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society and bringing them into one community where they are all citizens. And, it's, and he's done a lot that we can learn from. So I am proud um, to count Nasser as one of my friends. I usually say that I have to keep him as a friend because he's the only person in Nigeria beside whom I am, I am considered a moderate. You know, people usually, usually go to people and say, talk to your friend, um, Sanusi, or talk to your friend, the Amir. But people come to me and say, please talk to your friend, Nasser. Even two days ago, someone sent me to him with two messages. I delivered the first one, which I thought was nice and friendly and conciliatory. When I saw the reaction, I did not deliver the second one. <laughs> I'm waiting for the right time to deliver it. I still have to deliver that message. But you know, we've just said about how much he's invested in his own development. He's not just a quantity surveyor, he's a lawyer. He's got master's degrees. You've heard over 80 certificates from Harvard. And education is what makes the man. And one thing I can say when I, you know, I was telling someone who drove into this government house and he talked about how beautiful it was. I said, let me tell you something. If you take Nasser out of this government house today, and put him in a two-bedroom apartment. If he has light and his books, wallahi, it will not matter to him. There's no difference. And, and it's important that we realize that what we have, the positions that we hold, 
are transient and they do not define us. Anybody can be called a governor. Anybody can be called an amy. Anybody can be called a commissioner, a minister. At the end of the day, you owe it to yourself for the years that you are given that opportunity to know that God has given you a chance to do something, to leave a mark and to impact people's lives. Now, those people today may not appreciate it, including the people you are helping. There's a story of Chief Obafemi Awolowo when he started free, um, free primary education. They demonstrated against it. The woman came out naked. The fathers refused to pay taxes. He had to force them. All those people whose parents were complaining today are thankful they are professors, they are doctors, they are engineers. What we say about Nasiru today will not matter. Some of us will say things because we are his friends. Some of us will say things because maybe we want favors from him. What will really matter is long after he's gone, when the history of Kaduna State is being taught in a classroom to children whom he has never met, what will they say about him and what he did? And that is what is true of each and every one of us. We have to think not how the people around us, living with us, react to us. Each of us has to think in the next 50 years, 100 years when I am gone, when the history of this office is being written, what will it be said that I did? That is the most important thing, the legacy. So I pray for you that what you are building today remains a legacy that will be remembered after you. And my prayer for you is that you will impact the lives of people who you do not know, whom you have never met, in a manner that they will remember you forever. Um, of course, um, Nasir takes many risks. Um, people have said you can't say what someone is perfect. I said he has most of the qualities. There are two that I would like him to learn more of. One quality is diplomacy. I know it sounds uh, rich coming from me, but <laughs> but but I can actually advise Nasser on being diplomatic. You know, that is a good thing. He's the one person I can advise on being more diplomatic. The other is more patience with people. Because as we grow older, we realize that not everybody will be at our level. That sometimes what we see with clarity, it takes others a long time to see. And maybe there, there's, it's not malice, maybe it's not bad intention, it's just that they can't see it. And so sometimes we need to slow down. A final story of, um, like I said, he takes risks, and he needs to take, to take risks. When he had a problem with teachers in Kaduna State, some of his political friends came to me and said, advise your friend, he's on his first term. He should not take this risk, he can lose the election. So I said, okay, I will advise him, but I know you will not listen to this advice. I mean, I wasn't surprised, I knew what his answer would be. But I came to him, I said, Nasir, some people think you should wait until you get your second term. He said, Your Highness, if the people of Kaduna State want to vote me out, because I want good education for their children, let them vote me out. You know, and that is really the attitude. People, you, you win an election, after you win, you should be governing for the people. You should not have, you should not be in a campaign mode for four years. You were elected to deliver a service, deliver the service. If people appreciate it and vote for you, fine. If they don't, you have done your bit. The biggest risk he has taken, which I saw today, which I would be very careful about taking, is to have a documentary and have your wives talk about you. I'll be very careful about that.
Uh, I, don't think, I don't know if you saw this documentary, uh, but certainly if anybody offered to interview my wives, I would make sure I edited that documentary before it came out. <laughs> so on that note, um, Nasser, it's been, you've been part of my life, Hadiza, and then I, I, I met um, Asia and Umi later. Your, your family to me, as you know. Um, I've known you now for what, 44 years, makes me feel very old. Uh, we can't remember when we met each other. Uh, we're probably going to remain, we're going to remain friends and brothers and sisters uh, to, the, to the rest of our lives. And I do hope that for the rest of our lives, we continue to give back. As I said in your house, when someone said to me, continue sacrificing, I said, we are not sacrificing. This country has done everything for us. It gave us an education. It gave us opportunities to earn. It gave us opportunities to serve. What we do is paying back a little bit of what we got and trying to provide for the next generations the opportunities that we had, which sadly many of them are being denied. So this is time for reflection for all of us. We celebrate him, we encourage him, and we encourage ourselves to emulate him and to serve. Hallelujah.